All right, buddy, how you doing? Mark Ross, ITK Radio, with Arv Moltran, Mar Holtra, who is a professor of entrepreneurship at the great business school, Kenyon Flagler Business School at the University of North Carolina. Um, amazing. Arv, thanks for joining. Mark, it's my pleasure. Where are we finding you today? Uh, you're finding me in the attic of my house. <laughs> I love it, man. The quietest place um, where I can do work. <laughs> I need an attic. That sounds good. Yeah. How are how are things in the uh, Chapel Hill area? Things in Chapel Hill area are uh, interesting and uh, exciting because we're about to get a new building at the business school, and uh, some fun things happening. We're going to get a new dean soon, uh, and so it's exciting times. I know. I'm excited for the uh, the new complex. I mean, yeah. um, the what are the pol? I mean, maybe you can't. You probably can't totally talk to this, but the politics of the business school getting brand new facilities. I mean, are the other schools envious, or you know, are you just trying to keep up with the athletic department, or you know, what are the yeah. politics of architecture on campus? No, I don't think uh, there's politics as much as you know need to grow. I mean. Uh, when I walked into this building, it was very, very brand spanking new. And yeah. uh, and uh, sands of time make everything new old. So <laughs> we just needed to expand. Uh, there's a great deal of uh, interest in business school. So especially in the undergraduate population. And uh, I think we just needed to grow with the times. So that's uh, uh, It's been pretty... Uh, unanimous that we did need one and we were luckily able to raise the funds to have one and have the space to make one so now it's a great part of the campus and um no i'm excited to uh see it i haven't been down on campus in a few years but um it's always great to be in chapel hill it's a nice part of the world so all right let's jump right into it i'm um obviously entrepreneurship is super uh interesting exciting you know it's got a lot of buzz a lot of uh curiosity, mystical, you know, entrepreneurs are the new rock stars right now. Um, as a, as a professor in entrepreneurship, what are, uh, you know, do you get pushback? Like, can you actually teach entrepreneurship? Yeah, that's, it's a super interesting question, Mark, but let me go back and you said entrepreneurs are rock stars. Entrepreneurs have always been rock stars. <laughs> it's just the companies don't, don't suddenly appear out of the blue. I mean, they have to be started at some point. Microsoft, DuPont, Apple, HP, they were all small. So, you know, entrepreneurship is the lifeblood of renewal of uh, macroeconomy to some extent. So they've always been rock stars, so which leads to whether starting something in a garage that can be taught. But I think it's also large companies can, as we've seen over time, can be very entrepreneurial. So there's entrepreneurship, which is equally based on the same principles as entrepreneurship. So uh, pushback, no, uh, it's just people have different contexts. Some people want to start uh, young companies. Some people want to work in young companies and some people want to make old companies young. So it's always interesting. I think it's very, entrepreneurship uh, has always been seen as a startup, but I think there's more more openness to large companies uh, acting entrepreneurially over last uh, decade or so. So that makes so, it interesting. Yeah. Do you see entrepreneurship becoming more of a mindset as opposed to more of a occupation? That is like, it's more of a verb as opposed to a noun, I guess. Yeah. It's beautiful. You put it that way, Mark. It is, it's a mindset. It's, it's definitely a mindset. It's uh, I think it's always been uh, or it's always been a mindset, but it's uh, somehow that term has gotten associated with uh, startups, and right. uh, which are inherently entrepreneurship. But again, every company uh, faces a time for renewal, whether you're Microsoft, IBM, Apple. So the act of refreshing and renewing even large companies is entrepreneurial. As a professor in this space, I mean, do you see yourself sometimes almost as a coach, for lack of a better word, like, you know, that already feels like they can be creative or entrepreneurial. Like, are you, but are you like willing your students to be like, yeah, listen, there's a, there's a way to do this. If you have the right mindset, the right strategy, you too can be an entrepreneur. Yes. And that is exactly Mark what it is to convince people that uh, creativity is not just coming up with ideas, but it's also managing creatives. Right. So.
to understand that uh, some of the most innovative ideas come from people in the front lines of a company because they understand pain points of customers, they interact with customers. So this whole notion of you have had to go to a design school or you're super creative musician um, kind of black boxes people into thinking they're either creative or not. And I think inherently humans are creative. Uh, yeah. So instead of driving creativity out of them is to instill confidence to uh, be creative or manage creatives. I think the underappreciated uh, being at business school and thinking as a management scholar, it's about managing creatives, right? For the right purpose and rowing the same boat. Uh, and so, you know, you can choose the buckets, but I inherently do feel like everybody could be innovative. So that's the other thing, which is creative and innovative uh, innovation are used very, very interchangeably, but creativity puts this notion of, I have to come up with this brilliant idea. Uh, but some of the most effective ideas are simply making your customer happier. So, No, I like that perspective too. I never, um, I feel like I'm going back to school. This is great. So, cause I never think about managing creatives because I mean, um, I don't know, my, sometimes my own entrepreneurial tendencies, like I see a lot of opportunities, right? Like you're constantly like, oh, there's a problem, <laughs> there's a business, there's an opportunity. Yeah. So you get super distracted, right? Yeah. But the ability to kind of rein in or say, listen, you may have a hundred ideas, but let's take the top three and go to market. Um, so even managing, I guess, understanding how to work with creatives or entrepreneurs. Yeah, that's a real skill set. I never really think about that in terms of entrepreneurship. There's two sides to it. You need the creativity, but you also need the coach to say, you know, let's go this direction. Right. Creativity is out of possibility and management is out of feasibility. <laughs> At the end of the day, it's a commercial venture, right? So, um, but it's also, you know, not any, every individual doesn't need to come up with ideas. There's this, there are managers who need to um, listen to, Frontline, let's yeah. To face the problem, and then like you use the right word, coach them through a process of feasibility, whether it's a pro for profit or non profit. It's uh, they're brilliant ideas, uh, but are they feasible for current time? And then kind of managing your pipeline as to these are brilliant, but we need a few years for them to incubate, and these are brilliant that we should be doing because they solve our customers' problem tomorrow. How did you, um, I want to go back to your educational experience. You, you know, studied at the University of Delhi and then you went to the University of Southern California, which I would love to talk about. I'm a huge fan of uh, Southern California. So um, better, good tacos, good waves out there. Um, were, you, were you an entrepreneur like growing up as a kid or how did you come into studying and teaching entrepreneurship? Yeah. So I was an engineer by training, which should not be surprising you, but I think the art, uh, when we immigrated as a family, you need to be entrepreneurial to carve out a new space for yourself in a new country. Uh, that's very entrepreneurial. I loved engineering, but I loved business problems. Uh, that put me in a space to be entrepreneurial instead of being allies in between the engineering side and the business side. And then but being an engineer, I was always interested in technology. So uh, technology ended up uh, transforming businesses over the last four decades that I've been thinking of these things. So yeah, I've had to be entrepreneurial both from uh, my own social change, from my professional uh, bridging gaps and from uh, uh, my own self-interest to kind of keep figuring out how things are changing. No, I like that idea. Like is when I give advice on communications. I have this phrase, um, kind of global street smarts and that you should think high low in your communications. That is, you could be making a pitch, you know, say you're, you've got a biotech company and you need to raise money and your messaging in New York City could be different. The same message, but the style is different in New York versus San Diego, right? So there's a yeah. little bit of, um, you gotta be entrepreneurial and creative and kind of understand and the global street smart idea, I like that as an entrepreneur, cause you're right, you have to understand like what's happening in the culture, you know, why is basketball so important in North Carolina? You know, why is surfing so important in California? But, you know, having a, the whole context, um, I like that approach. I haven't thought about that as well, but I think just managing your own life and understanding what's happening in the culture makes anybody really entrepreneurial. And I think uh, not because you are the expert in the field, but it, 
a lot of innovations communication, right? Communicating your ideas, communicating the ideas to be implemented to the implementers, communicating the benefit of the idea to the customers, communicating the relevancy and the financial viability of the idea to financiers. And so it's a lot of uh, seeing your audience, which has turned global, there are no boundaries, and understanding the different needs of uh, communication to people. Um, and it's a, it's a lot about some brilliant ideas don't get see the light of the day because they're not communicated well enough, right? So they're communicated in technical feasibility, but sometimes it's the social and financial feasibility that uh, that are equally important and communicating those are 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 the key, right? In, in life, you're always communicating your uh, worth to somebody and uh, the worth of your venture to somebody and the worth of focusing in the right ideas in the society to somebody. So yeah, I see a lot of communications there. Talk about, um, yeah, I want to say you're, you've done a lot of work and focus on crowd using crowds for innovation and kind of crowdsourcing and um, getting back to like the pop culture myth. I think about like Sarah Blakely with her product um, mm -hmm. and like, you know, Steve Jobs, you know, so revered or, um, even like a Michael Bloomberg, like what he did in the tech space, you know, with his technology, you know, there's always like this one person, but they're obviously in a huge ecosystem. Um, one of my favorite quotes, and this may or may not be true, but Henry Ford apparently said, you know, if I asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. But, um, but crowds generally know what's happening, like in elections, pop culture, picking music, you know, betting markets are good gauges. Um, how did you come to like appreciate crowds? Like, where did that come from? Like, did you step back and say, "I need to study this space"? What was the, the what was the pain point to say, "What's going on with crowds"? Such a good question, Mark. Problems became more complex. Societal problems became more complex. Business problems became more complex. It became very evident the myth of individual solvers, to me, does not exist. Uh, yeah. Even, even those who we look upon as individual solvers, there's a lot of things that go behind uh, the scenes that, you know, a lot of confluence of ideas and opinions and thoughts. And so the problems got uh, more complex. And as an engineer, I had a clear indication that complex problems are not uh, solved by individual solvers rather than uh, multiple perspectives to be brought together, which is quite a lot of innovation. So, uh, a, the problems got complex and uh, having studied innovation, it, to me, it was very clear that uh, innovations, uh, integration of multiple perspectives. How do you get, um, yeah, so what's your advice to executives that, yeah, we have this hero worship, like, yeah, the great, uh, you know, business leader on the cover of, you know, Fortune magazine, or you get interviewed on CNBC and, you know, you're a brilliant person. Um, but how do you like say, listen, you probably, I mean, obviously they don't know everything, right? Executives, but it's almost like, a. I guess it gets back to the mindset too. Like, hey, let's test this before we go to market or let's talk to some different folks or what's happening in different countries. Can we import that into our market? What's your advice to executives saying, look to crowds before you make a big bet on a business? Yeah, and it's just not markets. Uh, it's baby steps, right? So what's inherent is, having an open mindset to admitting that you do not possess all the knowledge to solve a complex critical issue. And so first opening up to the team and you know, as a leader, realizing that you're not being looked upon for that moment of brilliance, you're looked upon to be hearing others because they do have perspectives on the problem as the, and the solution. From team to organization, and then the final step is the crowd. So crowd comes in, crowd scales itself based on how complex the problem is and uh, how much do you need to integrate other people. But it's just, you know, having an open in a mindset to just start with the team level, move to the organization level, and then kind of think about suppliers, customers. They all have perspectives on what you're trying to achieve. I like that you're saying like complex problems because I think about, I've been, uh, you know, I kind of make fun of entrepreneurs that, you know, they're sorting out how to deliver burritos faster. Like, you know, I'm, you know, it's great, but like, you know, the planet's got some real challenges 
around energy and um you know even elon musk has been getting some praise because you know he's like you know he's thinking about how to get rockets into space which is a huge capital investment and you know involves all kinds of crazy science um in some ways are you trying to push business students and entrepreneurs to be like listen there are a lot of easy problems that we could solve and make some money but if we're going to spend any time and energy let's go big is that part of the crowdsourcing movement like that kind of idea like let's go big yeah, I mean, look at how many <laughs> pandemic was a huge global challenge uh, problem, complex problem that we solved as a society, right? I think uh, there are super complex problems, uh, existential ones that need to be solved. So going beyond co- commercial interests, right? Commercial interests too, there are th- the simpler things have been done, right? So now the complex things, markets getting complex and dynamic and and fluctuating, but also the society's needs are now more complex. We have to address a lot of existential questions and, and I think they cannot be addressed without a huge, having an open mindset. And I think the crowd's just a substitute of humanity, right? So these problems affect us. It could be a large set of customers or suppliers. And so that's a complex problem, but the societal pro- problems are even more complex. So I think that's the push, I think. Um, companies solving both public private opportunities together is is a is very fertile ground for yeah. making the society better and the business better more responsible businesses right what is a um like how big is a crowd is it like i always think about like sometimes focus groups are great but like you know i mean 12 people you know how many people do you need to like sort out a crowd? Or I think about, um, you know, consumer packaged good companies, they literally will spend time in people's houses or they'll yeah. put them in mock, you know, kind of family room settings to see how they interact with a bag of chips or something like that. Um, and then th- for me, I'm also wrestling with like how much data, like, I mean, there's so much data we can collect and how do you balance all that? I mean, have you found a perfect formula or is it more yeah. trial and error? Yeah, no, I think the more complex the problem, the bigger the crowd should be, right? It's sorry to be a statistician, but it's a sampling error, right? So uh, the smaller the set of people you involve to solve a more complex problem, you you don't have the right sample set. So it's the same thing as a statistician would ask, like, or, or a pollster would ask, like, how many people should I ask to be representative of the true population, right? And so the good news is we don't have to think of, um, you know, if we are doing a focus group, we have to think of physical travel, bringing people together into a room and all of that. But if you're really talking about the power of technology, connective technologies, you don't have to worry about uh, restricting it. So right. the cost of involving people is just uh, appealing to the senses of people and convincing them that you're willing to hear them to solve this issue. Thinking about... Um... I always think about like college towns, like Chapel Hill's a classic college town, you know, Ann Arbor, um, University of Southern California is great, but it's, you know, it's like in this huge metropolitan area. So, but anyways, thinking about college towns is almost economic engines and the role of the business school. Like not only do you, do you have a responsibility to undergraduate students, graduates, alumni, but also the community and think about how the school can be, you know, this engine of economic development and innovation, um, do you guys wrestle with that as a business school? Like thinking about like what role we're playing for all these different constituencies, these different audiences? Yeah, no, I think uh, we don't wrestle with it anymore. I think we're pretty convinced that is the that is the model, right? It's uh, if you're a socially responsible business, it's you're part of the ecosystem of a community and a society. So I, I think uh, the good news is I I don't think we wrestle with that. It's 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 an obvious. Uh, thing to do, right? So, but we also have entities like Kenan Institute, which we're a university of the people, by the people, and for the people, right? So uh, the greater good of North Carolina, the greater good of United States, and the greater good of globe, I think uh, these are very intertwined. And the good news is we don't, our responsibility is to state of North Carolina. We're always driven by that. And we've always been conscious of that. So now, all the more across schools, across the university, I think that sense of purpose is, I see it very uh, pervasive and prevalent. So that's the good news. I I don't see wrestling. I think the wrestling is to get to the crux of the problem and solve it. Right. 
Talk about, um, I'm curious about undergraduates. I mean, there's sometimes there's such a need for specialization where, you know, you need to declare early on, but um, are, you, are we trying to see more like non-traditional business students, you know, or even like a medical student take one or two business classes or vice versa, like a business student take, you know, drama classes, get some other kind of traditional liberal arts. Um, as you think about education, do you, are, is it being a little more creative in the way students come together and sort out their degree? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think cross-disciplinary work uh, as it is at its peak right now. So School of Pharmacy and MBA, uh, School of Law and MBA, there's lots of intersectional issues that are coming, a regulatory. So that's there's going to be a business and uh, law problem. There's pharmacy, which is medi medicine and the better health of the society as a business problem. I, I I'm very enthused that I see increasing number of uh, dual degree candidates, uh, which is very promising, certainly, right? And and I see our undergraduates bring a very well-rounded perspective uh, by the time they get to a business school, which is more societally conscious and more cognizant of the complex problems facing us. Yeah, I was I've um, I've been spending. My, one of my good friends is a professor at Booth at Chicago, and he's been kind enough to invite invite me to kind of sit on these. He teaches entrepreneur strategy class as well, and they have the end of the year kind of wrap up uh, pitch is kind of the capstone, and um, you know they bring in outside folks to chat, and it's great. Like all these uh, young students, you know, much younger than me now, but I feel like I, I I can't see anybody starting a business now without some kind of appreciation for their role in society. Like you know, you're, you're, they're going to be good stewards. And trying to make a good positive role, which I think is a, a fascinating transition from, you know, greed is good in the 80s to now we're having folks that are really thinking about like, and I love this idea too, like they're solving problems. They're not just building a business, but they're really trying to solve problems. That's been an interesting evolution in the business school community, for sure. And I think it, I, I just don't want to say business school. I think everyone, school of pharmacy, school of medicine, law school, I think there's a greater appreciation again for solving things cross-disciplinary perspective rather than, you know, it's it's a business problem. Uh, business <laughs> problem is a society problem. A society problem is a business problem, but it's a legal problem. It's a medical problem many times. So I, I, I totally agree with you. I think it's very heartening to see uh, the undergraduate population have a, such a broad perspective of starting with a social problem and maybe it has a commercial venture in it. As we uh, wrap up here, I'm very keen to talk to you about global stuff. I think one of the great things Kenyon Flagler does is it forces students to go global, maybe even for the first time um, as part of their undergraduate program. And obviously, you know, me being a part of the one MBA program, absolutely fantastic. But even when you get, you're there at the business school, you know, there's flags from all the different students from around the world. So there's a very emphasis like, yeah, you're here in Chapel Hill, but you need to be thinking globally. And I think that the accessibility and just getting people out of their comfort zone. And um, I just think it's such an amazing experience to go visit other traditions and other cultures and other countries. It changes you in un unknown ways, even though you may not be a true global person. So I, how do you, do you see that continuing? I mean, is it getting stronger? Do you see more globalization with the, the business program? I do see it. I mean, I think there's great enthusiasm. We, we go to four different places. You know, in one MBA program, we, we do have an emphasis uh, on a voluntary basis, and it's been increasing. I haven't seen it decrease. And I think post-pandemic, I think there's a realization we're connected. <laughs> Some of these things we face are the same, but how we approach them are very different. And so I see, I was just talking to a few of our students who went to Zambia and Zimbabwe, and you can see, you know, even though I haven't met them in their text, I can see their eyes pop up and say, well, uh, we're similar, yet we're so different, and yet we have the same things that we need to address. So I do. I I definitely do, and I'm very enthused. My own son, who's about to start Carolina in fall, one of his primary things, we asked him, what would you like to do when you go to university? And it was about global awareness and travel and connectivity. So uh, I, I see that in every undergraduate, this recognition of uh, and I see it even more so in graduate level, the recognition of uh, need for global awareness. It's so exciting because I think it's happened within a generation. I think, um, I don't know, the first time I left the country, I was like a teenager. 
still a magical experience. And I remember um, there was a library I used to go to all the time and it had this like old school globe, which I was always fascinated by. It was like huge. And, um, you know, for me to like understand the world a generation ago, it was like National Geographic. Now it's like, you know, anybody can go anywhere, anytime. It's super exciting. I want to talk to you about, if you're up for it, I want to talk about India. India seems to be buzzing. It's like in many ways, the new China. Um, I'm, I'm actually finishing up. I'm writing about this, like Tim Cook going to China and how Apple, you know, opening a store is like telling the world, like it's game on. Um, but also other countries you find are doing some interesting stuff and um, other parts of the world you're kind of interested in right now. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in all parts of the world, but I can talk to you about, <laughs> you know, what really catches my fancy. I did take a group of students twice in two consecutive years to Vietnam, which. Uh, oh, wow. You know, think about it when I was a child, and I, my, my father was in the Indian military. So Vietnam had a very different perspective from a U.S. Uh, viewpoint. And now it is one of our best trading partners to go and understand on the ground that we were embroiled in a war over here. And now this is an economic engine that is uh, jointly with our interests producing things that, that are super interesting. And uh, yet they have a very different socio political economic perspective but it's uh, that's very eye-opening estonia is a small country that uh, you know we were uh, scheduled to travel in person but then we did a virtual <laughs> trip there we talked to entrepreneurs there and how they such a small country that is driven by global first because of the market size consideration inherent right. in europe first and then globe first you know how estonia is at the edge of thinking of cyber technology, education system, medical system. And then uh, I think we are thinking of taking them to Iceland and Estonia in person. Iceland is another super interesting, you know, the smaller parts of the world that used to be so small, but because of their global connectivity, uh, they play such an important role in uh, in the global trade. And so I did take them to pre-COVID to Israel, which is an engine of innovation. Um, sitting where it does sit. Uh, we're, we're focusing a lot on Africa, which excites me to no extent and uh, how they're doing. And you asked about India, you know, uh, having that larger population. Uh, India, I know, I can imagine, uh, I think next, I, I'm going to analyze like business reports or, you know, quarterly conference calls with multinational companies. I'm, I'm, I for sure am predicting India will get more and more space, more and more attention, um, which is, <laughs> is fascinating. It is. It is super fascinating. It's. I think it has reached, as you say, its peak period. I mean, I think this is the time where, as you said, Tim Cook went there. Apple's opening stores after all this while. Apple's producing there. So if you really look at both from a market and supply side, you know, these and, and India has a potential. And I think the next one, as you're thinking, Mark, uh, Africa. <laughs> It, it's median age is somewhere, you know, depending on who you read, it's somewhere from 18 to 19. That's, uh, you know, most of the growth in populations come, going to come there. Most of the young populations there and it has the perfect environment to be very entrepreneurial, to, to be part of the next generation. They can leapfrog, right? So many of the technologies uh, like mobile payments, even when mobile phones were not that prevalent, right? we're already thinking mobile pay payments because banking infrastructure was not developed. So I think the leapfrogging and the next source of innovation are from these countries that, where the youth movement is afoot and they are younger by nature. There's something to you I've been... Uh... I haven't executed this. It's on my, uh, I guess, roadmap, but it's like, I you're right. I love Iceland, Estonia. You know, I'm Scottish on uh, my father's side. So I think about these countries that punch way above their weight and just turns the soft power and, uh, you know, like they're committed to being in the market. I mean, Estonia, I think he's only got a million and a half people. I think more people live in Fairfax County, Virginia than Estonia. Um, but like adopting a country or just saying, hey, I'm going to like, I want to know everything I can about Tanzania or I want to know everything I can about Vietnam and kind of pick that over a year. Um, I think it would be an interesting experiment or a task for any executive to, because some of it's just getting accessible, just getting used to it or not feeling so intimidated. I think a lot of times the world can be an intimidating place, but if you kind of demystify it and kind of go in almost as a student, you know, you get nothing to lose. 
yeah, I, I think you nailed it. It's about demystifying. It's, you know, you have a perception of something till you read even five articles and your perception starts to change. Uh, and, and then you realize it's it's connected. And I just named a few countries. You can pick ASEAN, you know, Thailand. We took our students to Malaysia. We've taken them to Thailand. These Singapore, such a small place, plays such a giant role in the global trade. Uh, and so, you know, it's just you, you're absolutely right. The more you can just demystify a place and you just have to pick one. It could be some ancestral interest. It could be just interesting to you from many perspectives. Um, and so the more you demystify, I think reading is, it's something we try to impress, right? <laughs> just read. <laughs> just read. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. And you don't have to read. You know, we have podcasts now, right? So if you don't want to read, you can listen to a book. You can listen to a uh, an expert talk on a region and within 30 minutes, it makes a huge difference. I think if you just commit 30 minutes to understanding a little bit more about a region, it makes a huge difference. And if you ended up investing five hours, you'll just completely demystify it. No, the podcasting revolution or, you know, I just think about, I mean, I sound like such an old guy, but like the internet, I mean, the ability now to, you know, go to YouTube and watch, you know, France television live on the YouTube screen is just, you know, unbelievable. I mean, <laughs> what, a, what a time to be alive. Hey, as we wrap up, I'm curious, um, I like to ask people any books, any documentaries, any stuff they're reading or watching that's caught your fancy lately. Um, any recommendations? Oh. Besides your own book, we should recommend your book, of course. <laughs> that's a little bit technical. Uh, I think the book I'm reading, and I think there's a recency effect, which is beyond disruption, how to, since you, we started talking about in, innovation. It's a very interesting premise that not everything has to be transformative. Sometimes small innovations pack a lot of punch in the society. So, you know, kind of building yourself. So it's called Beyond Disrupted. I I have loved that book quite a bit. Uh, I read a lot. And, and so in many ways, Mark, I've also become a non- you know, because I, I take a variety of podcasts. To me, that's a book. Like, I, I make sure I devote two hours each day listening to whatever topic I pick. And then I pick three or four podcasts on those. And I can listen to them while driving, walking. Yeah. And so that's how I consume. I, I'm trying to be, be like more like my kids, which is they know a lot about things. <laughs> I, I wonder how 15-minute clips on YouTube. And my son's very into my younger one, who's nine-year-old. It was into golf and he was talking to me about golf yesterday and I was, I was like, you've never watched TV. Like I would watch a golf tournament on TV. You've never sat with me for five minutes. You have this <laughs> immense knowledge. And he's like, yeah, dad, I saw that on YouTube and that's the background. And that's, I saw on YouTube, this is the best way to do these things uh, in golf. Wow. I was, I was like, wow. Well, I mean, I, you know, conventional me would have told him to read uh, some book on <laughs> right. how to be a better golfer. <laughs> the unconventional me thinks, uh, yeah, that's, there's a lot of information. I think the power in sifting through this uh, and, you know, that's, that takes a little effort for me to discover the right podcast, combine them into a package, which teaches me a little social, a little political, a little economic. And I have a lot more, like you said, demystified impression of whatever I'm trying to do. Well, Professor, thank you so much for making the time. This was great. I felt like, uh, you know, I got a little, uh, I, lo I just love business schools, man. It's absolutely. Thanks, I'm envious of you, man. I was down in uh, Charlottesville a few weeks ago and, uh, you know, I skipped into Darden just wandering around and I don't know, it's cool. I, and I love the idea of like solving problems. It's not just about creating capital, but it's yeah. also like, let's do some good stuff. And uh, I don't know, business schools are being asked to do a lot of, a lot of different things, I think, than they were originally set up to. It's kind of interesting to see their evolution and um, the idea of solving problems is really exciting. Yeah, it is. Uh, and I think it's just, you know, we both are exposed to business schools, so we do have a bias. But, you know, when I listen to what School of Pharmacy is trying to do, I'm always impressed, you know, how rural medicine in rural areas or School of, uh, you know, greater school, which is thinking of drinking water in remote areas of North Carolina. That always... Uh, impresses me because you know it's uh, it's local but it has such a global impact well this is great thanks for making the time um hopefully we'll see you soon take care mark have a good day thanks for Ciao. Time. have a good day